just uh, should have a count of all the ingredients probably on the screen. Okay. All right, good morning. good morning. Everybody doing well? Yes. Go ahead and have a seat, we'll get started. So I wanted to start this morning and I'll, I'll give you a little experience of my own. I went online to look up why do we call this uh, the triumphal entry? Does anybody know the answer to that? Because I didn't see anything that explained that. They call it the triumphal entry. Uh, we know we call it Palm Sunday, but it's the triumphal entry of Christ. And I didn't really see anywhere where it says that, so I thought I'd come up with my own. <laughs> and you've probably heard me say this before, but what is triumphal about Christ getting to uh, what we read in Zechariah 9.9 about uh, riding on the colt, the foal of an ass, and so on, and riding into Jerusalem? What is triumphant about that? Because we know in a very short time, wickedness is going to have its work. Amen. So, how many of you remember Luke chapter 4, the temptation in the wilderness? And for anybody out there listening this morning, good morning, and I'm glad you're here listening, and I hope you'll pay close attention, especially to this first part, because Jesus had a purpose in his life. There was a purpose he came. Amen. God sent him to redeem us from our sin. Amen. The Bible tells us that God was in Christ to reconcile us to himself. Amen? Amen. That's scripture. Amen. So in the wilderness, the devil came to Jesus to tempt him. Jesus had been fasting for 40 days. And the devil came to tempt him. And one of those temptations was, if thou be the son of God, throw yourself down. That's suicidal. Amen. And the angels will catch you. Now, I want you to get very clearly, this was not a thought that Jesus had. This was the words of the devil coming to Jesus to throw himself down. And had Jesus obeyed what was said and said, well, of course the angels will catch me up, he would have died there in the wilderness in the rocks. He'd have never made it to the cross. Does that make sense? Amen. Later we'll read where they try to stone him. But yet he gets past that. Later, a place we go to Nazareth all the time when we're on our Israel Holy Land trip and we look out over this huge mountain and this is where the Pharisees took Jesus after he read the scripture in Luke chapter 4 and said, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. And they wanted to throw him over the cliff. So what's triumphal about Christ riding into Jerusalem, getting ready to face the cross? The fact that the devil didn't take him out early. And I want you to know if you believe anything about your own life and that God has something planned for you, you're here for a reason to work a work or to do something in some life or some situation in the world, then don't listen to the words of the devil to throw yourself down, to take your own life, Amen. to say, well, God will take care of me because once you jump off that cliff, there's another law that's in action, and that's called the law of gravity. The Bible says that Jesus said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So I'm not going to do anything foolish and say, well, sure, angels will catch me. But if somebody would happen to grab me and throw me over that cliff, it's very possible angels would catch me. But then again, if that's not the case, I hit the bottom, I go home to be with the Lord. And yes, Jesus may have gone back to be with the Lord, but our salvation wouldn't have been in place. Amen? Amen? Amen. So why we call it the triumphal entry is because he made it to that point 
of fulfilling Zechariah 9, 9. I guess we could uh, go back there real quick and <clears throat> see what that says. Uh, the Lord had said in the prophetic word, rejoice greatly, Zechariah 9, 9. O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation. What was his name? Yeshua, salvation. Lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Now listen, we have a lot of people looking for our Messiah to come. I doubt we'll see any of those people riding on a donkey. When the Antichrist reveals himself, I doubt that we're going to see him riding on a donkey because that's a humility. And he's going to want to be exalted because the nature of the devil is in him. And so he will rise up in a sense. But Jesus, because God was in Christ, humbled himself. Remember, he made himself of no reputation so that he could redeem us. He took on flesh and blood, died on a cross, a tree, which the Bible says is a curse to any man. And yet he did it for our salvation. Amen? Amen. So Zechariah 9.9 9 is going to be fulfilled. <clears throat> so some will say, I don't understand why he had to die. And many of you out there may be listening. Most of us in the church understand what the Bible says in the books of Leviticus and Numbers and so on and what was required to take care of sin. There was always a sacrifice required. Uh, some of the Jewish folks will, will say, well, that was if there was a, a sin of ignorance. Uh, you did something ignorantly. You offered a sacrifice. Uh, some of them will say, well, listen, Nineveh repented of their sin and there was no sacrifice offered. But that didn't cover them completely because the Bible tells us down the road, sin came back to Nineveh. And so the whole thing was just for a time frame. Sin was covered <clears throat> by a sacrifice. One point we read about a scapegoat where the priest would lay his hand on the head of the goat and send it out into the woods to take away the sins of the people. The high priest went in once a year to offer on behalf of the sins of the nation, of the people. And so we see that all through the scripture. But you may say, well, why did Jesus have to die? And I want you to understand, <clears throat> even the devils didn't understand that. You see, the devil originally was in the kingdom, and so were all of those uh, what we call demons. At one point, they were angels in the kingdom of God until there was an uprising, and the devil was filled with pride. He was called Lucifer, and so he got one-third of the angels to follow him, as the Bible says. But in 2 Corinthians, or excuse me, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7 through 9, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 2, 7 through 9, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom. Have you ever done something for somebody and you didn't want it to be known what you were doing? We could call that a surprise party, uh, a surprise gift. Uh, you send somebody to a place or a location because when they get there you have something planned out and you're going to surprise them they don't know what you're going to do or how it's going to come about but you have it all planned out already you've got it all set in store all the folks that you have there know what's going to go on it says here <clears throat> we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery God already knew what he had planned for the redemption of men for the salvation of men for sin to be dealt with once and for all. The wisdom of God and the mystery, even the hidden wisdom, he didn't make it known. 
It was with him. Just like we talk about when uh, the disciples with Jesus and Jesus said only the Father knows the time that he has set in place. So the hidden wisdom was that God knew what he had planned for redemption. It says, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Do you remember we read in Revelation there that, that the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world before sin had even entered in? Before a world was even in existence, the Lord had already made a plan and a way for the salvation, the redemption of all of us to bring us back to the Lord. But it was hidden from the eyes of men. It must have been hidden from those that were in the kingdom, the, the angels and everybody else, because they didn't know. And the Bible goes on to say, which none of the princes of this world knew. Neither did the leaders, neither did uh, Caiaphas, neither did Pilate, neither did Herod, neither did Caesar Augustus, some of the names of the time, Festus, who Paul would uh, address later in the scriptures, none of them, but neither did the princes and the powers of the air. None of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Amen. That's good we have reconciliation going on here. Husband walks in by himself and sits over there not knowing his wife is going to go over there. <laughs> of course, the nice thing is she didn't text him across the room. It was just like eye contact. So, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the foundation or before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Why? Because all of their works have been exposed. Jesus dying on that cross was the judgment of all things. Now those who accept the work of the cross enter glory. Those who reject the work of the cross suffer eternal damnation according to the scripture. Not my opinion or yours, but what the scripture says. Right? So every one of us have been brought in under this wisdom of God that was hidden from this world and the principalities of this world, was laid out before the foundation of the world. Think back 6,000 years uh, to the beginning of mankind and even a little bit further to where God put everything in order and in place for what we're living in. And all of this was there for you and I back then just as Christ who would be slain on the cross was there for us already. And some will say, well, you mean it was, that it was physically there? Well, no, it was in the plan of God. It was ordained, it was ready, it was being prepared, it was gonna come to pass because God was gonna have a savior for the world for all of us to come to. So as I said in the beginning, anybody who begins to lose hope Listen, there's a lot of it out in the world. I told you we were talking to some of these folks about helping some of the Ukrainians and then the Messianic Ukrainians and so on. And a lady sent me a, a message and she, she just said, it is so chaotic right now. If you can just email back and forth, it'll be the best thing for me because they're dealing with so many things, with so many people, with so many needs. And these things are happening all over the place. There's calamities in our world. There's uprisings in every area of the world. And so in all of this, we could lose hope. And especially those who are out there listening that if you don't know the Lord Jesus, you don't have any hope because he is the hope of the world. 
He's the light of the world. He's the salvation of the world. He's the only way out of all these calamities and all the destruction. He's the only way to make it into the kingdom. And so it says here from the beginning and the foundation of the world, he made a way for us. And all you have to do is come to that way. Don't give up. Don't listen to what you think or the thoughts of your own head, which were really the words of the devil. Throw yourself down. Pull the trigger. Drive off the roadway. Jump over the bridge, whatever the case may be. Uh, you know, how many different things. Snort some of this. Sit in the car with the car running and the pipe you know, exhaust pipe into the door or the window, whatever. These are not your thoughts. These are thoughts of the enemy, the wicked one who wants to kill you and would like to kill all of us. Amen. How can I say that? Because of my own experience of wanting to drive off the road when I was unsaved and drinking and partying and everything else and thought my life had no bearings whatsoever. And here I am, 50 years later, saying, thank God for Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen? Thank God for the plan of salvation. And thank God that even though in my messed up mindset at the time, somehow I yielded. That I still wonder what I did or why, but now I'm so glad I did. Amen. Wouldn't that be wonderful one day you just threw some money down on your uh, stock that you never heard of and somebody said I don't think it's a good idea and somebody else said I'm scared of that and somebody else said why if you buy that stock you're in a cult and yet you bought that stock not knowing squat about stock and all of a sudden it's worth millions of dollars wouldn't you say boy I'm so glad I hit my head on that door before I went and put that money because I was like incoherent when I put that money down on that stock. And that's nothing compared to what we're talking about with eternal life, Amen. with knowing the Lord, with seeing the kingdom, with going to be with the Lord forevermore in all of this. Amen? Amen. So are you glad he made it to the end of the road? Yes. Are you glad there was a triumphal entry? He bypassed all those things, overcame all those things. Listen, you've bypassed a lot of things. Amen. You've overcome a lot of things. Amen. Jesus said in the world you're going to have tribulation in John, but he said, be of good cheer, because I've overcome the world. Amen. And that's our future in every one of our lives if we just stay in Jesus, Amen. stay in this gospel. Amen. Don't listen to the words of the enemy. Don't shortcut or shortchange what God is trying to do in our lives. It's all for our good in the end. You know, when we had to try out for football or you had to, you know, go do sprints for the athletic, the track and field and all the other stuff. Or when you went to the Marines, man, it was rough. But in the end, you knew how to defend yourself. In the end, you knew how to sit in a stationary place, laying in water with your face almost down in the water and not move a muscle because it meant your life. And now you can do a lot of those things almost simply because you're so well trained. And you and I are supposed to be all the time perfecting ourselves, studying to show ourselves approved, being trained and and processed in all of this so that we can endure all these things and the tribulations because we can have good cheer as he overcame the world. You and I will overcome the world. Amen. I know that was mentioned at the Bible study now that I'm thinking about it. Down at Scope, if anybody, uh, start inviting people to some of these things and, uh, you know, go down and say, hey, you guys, whatever, or go down to the lunch thing with them and spend some time down there, whatever it takes, because we're seeing so many things happen out here. People need to know the Lord is here for them. Amen. And he's the only way out. Their religions aren't going to get them out of this. Their religions aren't going to save them in the end. Christ is the only mediator, the only savior. 
Amen? Amen. Remember, oh, I quoted it basically, but Revelation 13, 8 was about how the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. Hey, I want to remind you, too, that in all this and everybody, you know, there's a lot of people that somehow we're trying to make this so easy to understand for everybody that we say some of the most ridiculous things. I heard Jesus was a failure. Somebody said, do you know who the greatest failure in the Bible was? God. Where in the world do you get this stuff? Trying to relate to people. God hasn't failed at anything. Everything he ever said has come to pass and is coming to pass. Amen. And in the end, he's going to rule and reign. That don't sound like failure to me. Christ making it to the end of this doesn't sound like failure because of what he said in John 10, 18. You can write that down. Because nobody killed Jesus. Nobody took his life. No Jew, no Gentile, no Roman, no Greek, nobody. The Bible says that Jesus laid down his life Amen. for us. Amen. It's not a failure, it's a victory. Amen. He defeated death and hell because of what he did. He had to take on flesh to confront death, to overcome it. You see, you can't overcome anything in your life unless you confront it. You should write that down. Amen. All the stuff you said, I wish I wouldn't do anymore, and a lot of the stuff you should be saying, I wish I wouldn't do anymore. Because you won't ever overcome what you don't confront. Amen. Jesus confronted death. He confronted hell. The Bible says the last things to be defeated are death and hell. And that's all for us. Amen. Nobody took his life. Amen. Jesus wasn't a failure. He laid down his life. Like somebody who's uh, being held hostage. We could talk about the guys in the crib and the guys on the street and the gang and everybody else. Listen. Listen. If somebody said, listen, you deserve punished, you deserve suffering, uh, maybe in the group where you're at, you deserve to die for what you did, and somebody else stepped in there and said, I'll die for him, hopefully you would realize that I'm very blessed. And I need to change my life. Like I said a long time ago, somebody put a silver revolver under my chin. I realized I needed to change what I was doing. And where I was hanging out. Amen? Amen? But how many people have gone through so many of these things and haven't learned, haven't seen the darkness that's there? They're still thinking, oh, it's just a crazy thought. No, the devil plays in the, could call it the playground of your mind. Because you don't know how to fight those thoughts and battle them and war against them. And you don't even know it's an enemy, so why would you do that anyway? But we who've been trained by the Lord, and uh, as the Bible says in Ephesians, Ephesians 6.10, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. It's here on the wall. Do we think about that? A thought comes to do evil. A thought comes to harm yourself or whatever. You don't have any power to overcome it. You say, I've got all this, I've got all that. You don't have nothing. You submit to it all. And here we are, the little goody two-shoes, who have the very same wicked, evil thoughts, and we never pull the trigger. Have the same thoughts, we never cut our throat or our wrists. We have the same thoughts, but we never allow those things to bring us down because of Christ and the hope that dwells within us. You know, we talked a little bit here about chapter 19 in Luke, about the talents and so on. Um, you may say today, well, what talents do I have? Are you familiar with, I don't know if this is a scripture or not, it says something about this treasure in earthen vessels. Are you an earthen vessel? Yes. I can't hear you. Yes. Are you in Christ? Yes. 
then how could anyone say, I have no talents that the Lord gave me? He says, you're an earthen vessel. Amen. What's in that earthen vessel? A treasure. What's the treasure? The Bible talks about a treasure, treasure buried in a field. And a guy went and sold everything he had to buy the field. Do you treasure what Christ has put in us? What the work of God is in us? The pearl of great price. It's the kingdom. It's Jesus. Do you understand that if he's been put in us, and doesn't the Bible say he dwells in our hearts by faith? Amen. Doesn't the Bible say we are the temples of God and the spirit of God dwells in us? Yes. So how dare anybody say to God, God, you didn't give me a talent. <laughs> Think about it. When he comes and says, I gave you 10 talents, what have you done with them? I gave you five talents, what have you done with them? I gave you one talent, what have you done with it? What are we going to say? We tried? I mean, at least if we try, we may not have done so hot in front of the world. Look, you could look at us as a church right now. I say, Lord, I know we're still preaching the gospel. Are we like in some quagmire? Is there something working against us? Or should we just rejoice that we're going on in the Lord? Hey, Bible says he'll add to the church daily as many as should uh, come in. But it doesn't mean that you and I aren't still supposed to share the gospel. It doesn't mean that you and I shuck every responsibility and say, well, God's not doing it. Well, God sometimes won't do it if we don't do it. Amen. Right. Amen. If you go out and say, I want a garden in my backyard. Lord, bless me with a garden in my backyard. Lord, bless me with fresh uh, fruit or vegetables or whatever, but you never go till the ground, you never plant the seeds, you never weed the areas and so on and keep it taken care of. Should you really expect a garden in your backyard and fresh fruit on your table or fresh foods? I think not. Amen? Amen. Nobody took his life. So you got a lot of religious so-called Christian people that them Jews killed Jesus and we hate them. Well, Jesus himself, the one that you say you're defending, said nobody took my life. Nobody had the power to take it. Amen. But I had the power to lay it down. And he said, and I have the power to take it up again. Hallelujah. Listen, if you think life's killing you, I'd say do what Jesus did. I'm taking it back again, the life that Lord put in me. Now, he could have taken back another life, and you and I could take back our old life. You want to be very weary of that one. Wary of it, I guess, would be the better word. You don't want to be picking up your old life. But many times we lay down our lives in the sense of somebody's trashing us or somebody, like I talked about, I think, Wednesday night, uh, mocking ridiculing, whatever, and we can humbly submit to that because we value their soul more than the old man that we would have to defend. And if you're still defending your old man, I wouldn't be looking for saving grace because you're not dead to yourself. Amen. And if you're not dead to yourself, then Christ is not alive in you. You hear me? It's a lesson for the whole church. You know, we got that meeting tonight, and I said yesterday they asked me to pray about Jesus cleansing the temple. And I'm not going to convolute the two here, but man, I thought uh, that's a topic a lot of people don't want to hear about. Oh, we could have, you know, we have our, our girls used to clean. We have a lady who cleans now and so on, and we could talk about how clean the pews are how it smells so fresh when we walk in the bathroom. And look at all the sweeper marks. They're almost perfectly in a row over there. Because that's what we look at and what we think. Did we come to church today because there'll be new flowers or, you know, because, well, the cross will be decorated so beautifully. Why did we ever start doing that? The cross is a, 
a symbol of shame, a curse. And we're dressing a curse all up and making it beautiful. And how many other things have we brought into the church and dressed them up nice and made them look good? The old thing, you can dress up a pig in a suit and tie, but when you let him go, he's still going to jump in the wallow because that's his nature, right? But if you could change that pig into something else that wouldn't jump in the wallow and forget the suit and tie, that'd be a far better thing, wouldn't it? Especially if you don't like pork. (laughs) All right. Let's go to, I don't know, you got anything out of that so far? Anybody, if you're listening, I don't know who listens. If you share this with somebody, listen, we talk about suicide. It's happening all over the place. Half the time when you read the paper and it says uh, cause of death is pending or, you know, some other things, you know, it's not known at this point. Half the time it's a suicide. Something we barely ever heard about back in the 50s. You know, you'd hear about one every so often. Now you hear about it all the time because pressure and stress and life and feeling worthless because there's so much garbage being poured into everybody from every media source, from life itself when the Lord ordained none of this for men so that our lives have become numbers. I said this, I think, on Wednesday night. If you're a human resource, what does that mean? Resources are things we pull out of the ground. They're stones and rocks and minerals and elements. And now we call you a human resource, which means you're not like them. You at least are alive, I guess, if that's what it means. But when we started changing all these titles, remember when we used to have a garbage man? That goes back to what, the 60s maybe, the 70s? We called him a garbage man, and he wasn't offended. Now he's a sanitary engineer. (laughs) That's why he doesn't get out of the truck anymore. (laughs) And you pay more, and he does less. And I'm fine with the guys that I know, some of the guys around town here. I'm fine with all that, but look how we've, this is progress. (laughs) Pretty soon, mechanics will have some delicate title and so on, and they won't have to touch your car. It'll all be... Uh, artificial intelligence. Listen, this thing is really going wild. I don't know if you know that. Do you know they have machines that now are robotic? They'll go down the garden rows and they'll look at every pepper, examine the pepper, examine the size of it. In 29 seconds or less, they'll pick the right pepper, leave the other ones growing, and they just keep doing this over and over again. They've got machines that they just, you know how you like the idea of that little sweeper going around your house? that you never have to touch it. You just program it once and it does it all the time. They're doing massive fields of farming with all that. They're not gonna need the immigrants anymore and the migrants and so on. What did they used to call the farmers that moved back and forth or the pickers? Migrant, migrant workers, yeah. I remember when I was down in Virginia one time, I was there during apple season picking and all of these trucks pulled in and all these guys jumped out. I mean, it's kind of fun and neat to watch. And you know, they're hard workers and they get paid and they all travel together. Sometimes they sleep in the truck. Sometimes they'll rent a room and 10 of them go in there and sleep. And then they go to another field and another place. Anyway, let's go back to the word. So I want to get it very clear that Jesus didn't fail. Jesus accomplished exactly what he came for. Amen. Amen? And listen, for every one of us, we read about these disciples and different men. They didn't fail either. Amen. And in their persecutions and in their dying in the martyrdom at the place where they did, the body of Christ was stirred and strengthened. And the Bible talks about when there was persecution and people were sent out, somebody could have said, look at that, the church is being scattered. But what happened? Revival went to everywhere they were, every place they found themselves. Churches were being established. The body of Christ was growing. 
There is no failure in Christ. Amen. In anything. Everything you and I go through, he says, it's going to work to your good. Somebody may say you fail, but you stay in Christ. It's no failure. I can attest to that with my own life. How many times I thought I was a failure. Amen. And that was while I was born again and things were just blowing up all around me. And a lot of people helped me out with that thought. Yes, you are a failure. Look at you and so on. <laughs> Only thing is, I thank the Lord all the time for where he's brought me to. Amen. And if it's just this, then it's just this. It's enough. Amen? Amen. Okay. So let's go to, uh, let's see. I got two things here. We can either go to Mark 11 or, which I guess we have a little bit of time. Let me, let me do this. You remember what we talked about in Luke about a certain nobleman or a certain man uh, went to receive a kingdom, right? You remember all that? Uh -huh. um, and then Jesus went on to give the parable to the disciples and to those that were in him, with him about what went on. But how many of you remember why he said that to them? Why did he tell them that parable? Do you remember that they had been down and I think just before that is Zacchaeus, so they're in Jericho and now they're heading up to Jerusalem. Uh, it says in uh, Luke chapter 19, I should make sure of this, uh, verse 11, he told them why that this nobleman was going away to receive a kingdom. Oh, I'm in. 11, whoops. Yeah, so in verse 11, he said, and, and as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable. He tells us why he's going to talk about this parable. Because he was nigh to Jerusalem. So they'd been walking for a while because from Jericho to, Jer uh, to Jerusalem is about a, 35, 40 minute bus ride. Of course, that's on the roadway. They're going a different path as they go through. So he had a bit of a walk, but now they're close to Jerusalem. And because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. So Jesus, knowing what they're thinking, that the kingdom of God will appear very quickly, he tells them a parable. That parable is about the nobleman who went away, and he went away to receive for himself, it says in verse 12, a kingdom. Do you remember we read this? But I don't think we did verse 11. So here we are 2,000 years later, almost, and people are still of the mindset that we're going to receive a kingdom here immediately. How many of you know, we've talked about this in church, there were those people who back in the late 70s, if I remember right, uh, they were called Kingdom Now people. And they believed that they were setting up the kingdom here on earth. But if we look at the scripture rather clearly, we see that Jesus left the earth to go and receive a kingdom, right? Is that what the scripture says? Amen. To receive for himself a kingdom and return. So I stay, say today, we're still saying the same thing that do you remember the disciples in Acts chapter, I think it's one or two, it's in the beginning there, I think it's in one, that Jesus was about to depart and they said to him, Lord, will you now restore the kingdom of Israel? And all of you may say, well, what's that got to do with us? It's got everything to do with us because in our patience waiting on the Lord, when he comes, he's going to set up his kingdom. 
you and I aren't setting up a kingdom. We're here to be ambassadors of that kingdom. When you're an ambassador of something, you're away from it usually. You're working in another land. You're working with other people and representing what kingdom you're of. And so we don't really know all the full details of the kingdom, but we're representing it to all these people that are in front of us. We're telling them that you need to come, like Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, the kingdom is nigh unto thee. And so you need to get yourself ready because when this king sets up his kingdom, the mighty warrior that he is, you either obey or you're destroyed. Now, everybody may say that's not fair, but listen, this king has waited and waited and waited. Do you know, many times you'll hear about this when a country is going to go into war, and we've done this, the Israelis do it, I know others do too, before they go into a place, they will send a plane and drop flyers everywhere that says, listen, you know what's going on here? We're going to have to come in, get out, because we're going to have to bombard this place. Now, I've shared this before, and I have a video where the Israelis at one point, when they were going into a place, I believe it was Syria at the time, and the terrorists had one floor that they were working out of in the midst of a public building. And so what the Israelis did was they shot these little missiles through the windows of that floor, and it blew out the inside of that floor and nothing else. Didn't do the structure of the building, didn't hurt anybody in the floor on top of them or below them. But those people on that floor that thing hit would have probably, if they lived through it, came out and said, those people are terrible, they're horrible. Look what they've done to us. Although they were the ones that were using children as fronts and people as fronts, and let alone you're in a public building when you're at war and you're terrorizing and so on. So the Lord has made known for, let's just say from the time of Christ, uh, when we start our calendar, that he's made known to us that all of this is coming to pass. He may not have dropped a letter at your house, but gee, if you got a Bible in the mail, if you turned your TV on and somebody told you about why you need to be saved and born again, you watched a church service, you heard uh, some public event where they had a minister that shared and talked about the gospel, whatever the case may be. You went to a breakfast, you went to a seminar. Like I've said so many times, a lot of these business seminars, they'll talk about what the Apostle Paul said and they use it all for business. You've heard some of the gospel. So you may not get a little literal flyer dropping out of the sky, but on every front, you've heard something. You've had opportunity. We've had opportunity. Many of us came to the Lord because of some of those things. Isn't that right? And then all of a sudden, you're in a church, but you didn't just wake up one day and say, I'm going to go to the church. No, somebody invited you or somebody told you about it or somebody shared with you. You saw something on TV or on the radio. You heard something. Somebody showed you love and said, it's because of Jesus in my life. And so one day you said, I'm going to go to church. And you thought you chose the Lord, but actually he chose you. Amen. Just like he didn't have his life taken from him, he gave up his life. Amen? Amen? Because that's the love of God for all of us. So there's so many things here. And yeah, it's, uh, I'm, I've got it in my notes here. Acts chapter 1, where they said that Jesus... Uh, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Do you remember what he said to them? Which, listen, everybody, I know I'm not going to say don't be involved in politics, don't hope for the United States to rise to power again. I'm not going to say all that. You do all that on your own. But look at what Jesus said when they wanted to know whether the kingdom was going to be restored. Jesus, you know I'm serving you. 
Are you going to restore America to the great and mighty power again? What does he say to us? It's not for you to know the times and the seasons which the Father has put under his own power in cha uh, chapter 1 of Acts, verse 7. Verse 8, he said, But ye... <coughs> verse 8, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. What's he saying to the disciples? Get your eyes off of what you see. Look up. Set your affections on the things above because you are going to be endued with power. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Why is Jesus going away? So that he can send the Holy Ghost. So that he can send power into all of us. That power to change. That power to be converted. That power to shed sin from our lives. Power to overcome the world. The power to grow and mature. And be perfected. Be holy as he is holy. The power. He says get your mind off of the kingdom in front of you. Everybody, are you listening? Outside here, are you listening? Get your eyes off of some of what these things are and always hoping for that to get better. Get your eyes geared on the fact that the power of God should be working in you and me. Amen. We're endued with power from on high, he said. Boring days, boring message. Oh, we're going to hear this again? When does it change us? When do we say, well, listen, what am I praying? What am I pushing into? What am I doing with those talents, with that treasure, with that pearl of great price, the kingdom of God, what I'm waiting for, what I'm proclaiming to others? What's it doing? How's it working? Am I shedding a lot of the things of my flesh, the old man, the old ways? Am I obeying what the gospel says and living these things out? But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Hey, we like to... Say, I'd like to do what Jesus does. Well, he was a witness in the earth. He was the testimony of the kingdom. And you and I are witnesses in the earth and the testimony of the kingdom. That's why I've been saying a couple times here lately in church, the Bible talks about being at peace among yourselves. The Bible says we're to love one another with a pure heart fervently. Well, listen, if we... Oh, and then he says, the, no greater love than you lay down your life for your friend, right? So we could talk about that with Jesus. He laid down his life for us. He's my friend, so I should lay my life down for him. You and I, I hope, are friends. Amen. So we should be laying our lives down for one another in the sense of, it's not all about me. Amen. It's not all about you. It's about the body of Christ and who he's brought us to be. A lot of this isn't even being talked about in the church anymore. It's all about ego and self and how beautiful you should be and wonderful things should be for you. Well, listen, we read about all these sacrifices in the Old Testament. What are you sacrificing unto the Lord? Do you sacrifice any of your trips, any of your time, any of your luxuries? Do you sacrifice any of the things you just want to do and made that your goal? What happened to all that? Where did we get into all this self-pleasure? And however I live is how I'm going to be. We talked about idolatries, I think, on Wednesday night a little bit, if not last Sunday. We idolize our own selves. A lot of times we need to say, yeah, this is how I've been doing it, but I'm going to throw that off because of the, the gospel, because of Jesus. 
How many of you lately have just said, you know what, I'm just going to go bless somebody financially as under the Lord, not just this thing out here, pay it forward that all the world's doing, but blessing as under the Lord and say, I'm going to help somebody that's in a need. Remember when he talked about what a true fast was back there in Isaiah 58? Helping the poor, feeding the hungry, meeting the needs, all these things. And I know it's nice to be able to go to places and do all these works where you've raised the money and everything from everywhere else. But what about when it comes out of our coffers? And that's why I've said with us helping the Ukrainians and helping the Messianic Ukrainians and investing in all these ministries as a church. I just had somebody say to me again, you know, it must be the Lord because God blesses financially where he puts people in ministry. He puts people in. Hey, listen, we've been blessed to help a lot of people. Amen. Been blessed to pay people's bills and everything else and salaries and so on. Uh, not to be foolish about it or just take everybody who now says, well, gee, if you're giving away money, I'll take some. <laughs> you know that needs crucified in you. Amen. Because as long as that's there, you will not be blessed. When you decide I'm going to be a giver, the Bible says he loves a cheerful giver, Amen. not a cheerful receiver. <laughs> Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. Running over. Shall, running over shall men give unto your bosom, right? Amen. Giving, letting go. Hey, you know, I found something a long time ago. I'm willing to suffer loss. Are you? Because in my suffering loss, I'm real, realizing that's not my God. Amen. And it ain't my goal in this world. Amen. Think about it. Other men have helped me along the way and blessed me with things and I've blessed others. And so it goes all the way around the horn sometimes. But that's what God will do for us. But we better never forget the days we were indebted because we don't want to be that guy that goes after the person who's now indebted to us and say, I'm going to choke you if you don't give me my money. Because then the Lord says, then I'll do the same with you, with all you've been forgiven of. Amen? Amen. It's not for you to know the time and the seasons. I guess I'm going through all this because... I hear so much about this. Listen, we're the church. Amen. How many of you remember a couple of weeks ago I talked about the only institution that the gates of hell will not prevail against is the church. Amen. Who's the head of the church? Jesus. What better head could you have? <laughs> if you had a company and... He was the CEO of your company. Nothing, no matter how bad it looked, would ever be a failure. Amen. Everything he did would be blessed. Amen. He's the head of us. We're the body of Christ, the church. He says there's going to be glory in the church by Jesus. That means because of Jesus. Amen. You stay in the church, the true body of Christ, Without all this stuff, I can't go here, and I won't submit to that, and I'm about the kingdom. Listen, the church is the ones ushering in the kingdom, Amen. preaching the kingdom, teaching the kingdom. The kingdom is what Christ is going to bring. Because, do you remember Luke 24, 21? It's on the road to Emmaus. Jesus, this is after his resurrection. He's walking with these two disciples. He said to them, what are these things that you talk about amongst yourself? And why are you so sad? Why are you so down in the dumps? America is falling. Jesus, haven't you heard? America's falling. Socialism's overtaken us. Inflation and so on. Weren't you there? Aren't you here in America somewhere? Don't you know what's happening? 
Listen, everybody, I'm going to keep saying this. If America falls, your king hasn't fallen. Your Lord hasn't fallen. He hasn't failed. He's not asleep. He hasn't left us or forsaken us. These nations, he said, are as a drop in the bucket to him. You and I are more precious. Your soul, each individual, each, every one of you and me, is more important to the Lord than America is, Amen. than the European nations are when they mound up together again. Rome and all of its power isn't as important to God as you are, as I am. Amen. Think about that. And how many people are really clinging to Christ? How many people are realizing the church is where we should have all been running? Not just when the towers fell or when the war happened in Iraq or, you know, when they take away our dollars or any of that kind of stuff. No, we should be running to the church all the time. But then, like, like I said, I got to pray about something tonight at this meeting. Listen, have we cleansed the church? Is the church clean enough that Christ will even come in? Uh, you're the temple. Forget the building part. Are you into idolatries? Am I into idolatries? Is there dirty stuff in my temple and yours? Things that have been hidden in years. We put it in the closet one day and then the people came back and they went to hang their coat in there. So we shoved it under the bed. Now they're getting ready to pick up and put new mattresses in. So we pull it out of there and stuff it in the kitchen cabinet till somebody's hungry. We just keep moving it around. It's time like a lot of us have realized we have to throw some things out. Amen. You can have your house all cluttered up, but if your temple's cluttered up, there's a problem. Because you know what? If your temple's uncluttered, you're probably going to get your house uncluttered too. Amen. Amen? Because the Lord will work in all that. Amen. Luke 24, 21, this is what they were so sad about. They were all bummed out about. Their nation wasn't coming to preeminence like they thought it was, the Jewish people, because that's not the way the Lord laid it out. But it is going to come to pass that they're going to rule in the earth when he sets up his kingdom. We trusted in Luke 24, 21. That's what we set our heart on. You say, I trust in the Lord. That's what you set your heart on. Whatever the Lord deems necessary or wills, that's where we'll go. That's what trust is. These guys said, but we trusted that it had been he, which is Jesus that they're talking to, which should have redeemed Israel. Remember back there, seven days or eight days after his birth, they took him to the temple. Mary brought Jesus in her arms. There was a man there named Simeon who said, I've beheld the salvation of God, the redeemer of God. Not that the nation as a political power, but the people would be redeemed. And you and I are redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I am. We've been redeemed by the Lord. What he came to do is being accomplished in every one of us. Millions and millions of people before us and hopefully... Lord willing, if the time goes on, millions after us to be redeemed. He came to redeem Israel, but Israel that he's talking about is not just the national land. It's the people who will serve him, Amen. both Jew and Gentile, the Israel of God, as the Bible says. We trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. Again, this is on the road to Emmaus. They don't know who they're talking to. They don't understand that he knows who he came to redeem. He didn't come to seek and save. 
a nation and put it back together. He said, I came to seek and save that which was lost. Amen. I came to save sinners. Amen. Amen? Amen. Of which are you and I. And blessed to be in the Lord. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So let's go ahead and go to Mark chapter 11. We'll just spend a few minutes here. So when Jesus and they came nigh to Jerusalem in 11.1, unto Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of, Olive to, uh, of Olives, uh, the backside of the Mount of Olives facing the Dead Sea, we've been there many times on our travels to the Holy Land. At the Mount of Olives, he sendeth forth two of his disciples and saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you, which is over there that you can see. And as soon as you enter into it, you shall find a colt tied. Zechariah 9, 9 is going to be fulfilled. So he's telling them he's got knowledge. He's got uh, what we call in the scriptures in Corinthians there. It talks about a word of knowledge. He knows, he says, go over there, there'll be a colt tied. Go your way into the village over against you. As soon as you be entered into it, you shall find a colt whereon never man sat. And loose him and bring him. And if any man say unto you, why do ye this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him. And straight away he will send him hither. And so they obeyed. They went their way in verse 4 and found the colt tied by the door without in a place where two ways met. And they loosed him. And look at what happens. Exactly what Jesus said. A certain of them that stood there said unto them, Why do ye loosing the colt? And they said unto them, even as Jesus had commanded, and they let them go. So they were going to where he said to go. They saw what he said they would see. They met who he said they would meet. They answered the way he said to answer. They resolved the issue as he said they would resolve it. And they walked with the colt. And they brought the colt to Jesus. And cast their garments on him. And he sat upon him. And many spread their garments in the way. And others cut down branches off the trees and strawed them in the way. Now, nowadays, let me just tell you this. When you're in Israel and you go cutting branches off of a tree, you'll have a lot of the locals yelling at you. In fact, if you pull some flowers out of the ground they might even attack you because they say these things are precious. But what did this represent? It represents a new regime, basically. In the eyes of the Romans, this is what it signifies. Something is going on here. There's an uprising happening as they're laying their garments in the road because they only do that for royalty and for the powers that be. And they're doing this for Jesus. And many of you have walked Palm Sunday Road with us there coming down the Mount of Olives, but you've never walked over up to the other side, to the gate, into the city. They're near the Eastern Gate, the Golden Gate. Amen. One year I had, and Josh is here now even, as a matter of fact, we were uh, there and it was just me and he traveled with me to just have somebody there. And we came out of the old city walked down the hill and walked up the uh, pathway next to Palm Sunday Road. We didn't take the roadway. I won't go into any more detail there because it's a funny story and it's long. And I don't want to embarrass Josh. Because <laughs> we were struggling getting up that hill. Anyway, he was only, I think you were 18 at the time or something like that. 18, maybe 19. Anyhow, uh, some little old man passed us on the way up in his 80s and he said I walk this hill every day anyway normally we come down Palm Sunday Road 
the one last trip we were on in 2019 before the pandemic, uh, we didn't get to do that. And some people weren't physically able to do it. So when we went down to the bottom there where the Garden of Gethsemane is, we just sort of walked up the pathway a little ways, turned around, took a picture, said, hey, look, we're walking down Palm Sunday Road. You probably walked 20 feet and you were at the end of it all. But you were able to say, I did it. Amen. Amen. So they brought the colt, they cast their garments on him. Now he's coming down the Mount of Olives where we go up there, we take pictures, we see the hotel up on top, we look down over the cemeteries and everything else. He's riding down from there. Uh, Bethphage is over a little bit to the left there uh, as you uh, would come up and down the mountain. So it's not over by where the, uh, used to be called the Intercontinental Hotel. I think it's called the Seven Arches. Back at the old days, we stayed at the Intercontinental. What a beautiful view. You look out one side, you see all the old city and on up into the new city. And then out the other side, you see all the way down to the Dead Sea when there's no fog or smog or clouds or whatever. Uh, just fantastic view. That's all sort of gone by the wayside up there. So they brought the colt to Jesus, cast their garments on him, and he sat upon them, and they spread uh, their garments in the way. And others cut down branches off the trees and strawed them in the way. And they that went before and they that followed, a massive crowd it sounds like, cried saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna being Lord save, save now. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David. Remember, this promised Messiah is going to sit on the throne of David forever, the Bible says. It says a kingdom without end. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, save, save now. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem. So the crowds following him, they're cheering. They're shouting Hosanna. They're happy. You know, they believe this is the overthrow of the Romans. And we're going to take back our kingdom. And all's going to go well. And we're going to live at peace. And oppression is going to be lifted from us. And you know, if you talk to people, that's exactly what they want now. These globalists will tell you the world and your life is not going back to what you knew it to be. Ain't going to happen. It's going to be different. Amen. But in Christ, it's still the same. Right? You still pray, you still read your Bible, you still worship, you still serve, you still walk, you still Amen. bless to the Lord. In Christ, it's still the same because... They can't change what the Lord has done for us. Amen. They can't overpower the Christ that we serve. They're going to overpower this world and all of its subjects. That's why you and I better realize when Jesus said, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. It's what he's talking about. They didn't stop him from fulfilling what he came to do. They just didn't understand what he came to do. And the princes of this world, if they knew that him dying on that cross was going to set all of us free, they'd have never let him get there. If they'd have known that was going to keep you and me and multitudes along with us and what he said in the scripture, when I'm lifted up, I'll draw all men nigh unto myself, signifying what manner of death he would die. If they'd have known, they'd have left him alone. They'd have let him rot in his old age as a human body without doing a thing so that you and I could never come to the saving grace that he's ordained for us. Amen? Amen. Think about that. The devils didn't know. Listen, don't think the devils know everything when they're messing with you. They don't. They don't know your thoughts. 
You pray in your prayer language? Amen. They don't know what you're saying. The Lord does. The Bible's very clear about these things. Somebody may say, well, give me scripture for that. Ah. <laughs> so it talks about the mysteries that eye has not seen or ear heard, but the spirit, the spirit, when he talks about in Romans 8 that we pray the perfect will of God according, or according to the perfect will of God for the saints when we pray in the spirit, we thought it was better for you to get that job, but now that job is consuming you or that business or that family thing or whatever. It's taking you far from the Lord. Well, we should have prayed, Lord, your will be done. Maybe if they never got the job, never started the business, never got in that relationship, God would have sent them another wife. God would have opened another door. God would have brought something else to pass. Amen? Amen. So they said, Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he looked round about upon all things, and now the eventide was come, he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came if happily he might find anything thereon, looking for a fig because he's hungry. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of the figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, the tree, no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. And when they come to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. So... We know at one place it says that he, either this time or the other time when he cleansed the temple, he made a whip and he drove them out. Here it says that he overthrew the tables, cast them out that sold and bought. You know, you try to say some things to folks about the church and, the, you know, the church, the building here itself isn't holy. This was the holy place during the time. It was the... Uh, the shadow of the things that were to come, the Bible says. We know the Bible tells us that the Lord doesn't dwell in tabernacles made with hands. That's why he said, you and I are the temples of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in us. So, in a sense, we could say that, listen, even though some of that stuff may go on in the church building, but what is going on in these tabernacles? And in, in that sense, we might say, well, because I don't let that in my tabernacle, I'm not about, you know, just buying and selling. So when I go to church, I'm going to talk to you about my business deal. I'm going to make sure I stay in this church because these people, you know, they're going to need insurance when they're a few more years older. And I'll make sure this and that, that that kind of stuff isn't in us. That's what Jesus would have drove out if we were the temple that he was in our own selves. And he should be pushing a lot of these things out of us now. That's what conviction's about, the Holy Spirit convicting us of how we're living, what our desires are. Listen, and who we're really serving. Amen. Are we serving self? Are we serving somebody around us? Or are we serving the Lord in all this? So he drove them out. He overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold the doves and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. Now, I don't know if this is a Sabbath day, but the Bible says they're to bear no burden on the Sabbath, which means if you're in the service, I guess, of the things of the temple, 
that maybe you're not supposed to be carrying things around is why he said that uh, concerning the vessels. And he taught saying unto them, is it not written, my house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Listen, a lot of this stuff where people are trying to prosper through the church, they're prospering through the people of the church. They're selling their goods and wares and, you know, building up a lot of this stuff. You see, it's so sad. You got people giving into all these events and things and you find out the, the guy in the main place is using so much massive wealth and everything that could go out to multitudes of souls and feed people in the communities and everything else, as the Bible says, instead of just living a life. You see people that there's a husband and a wife and they're living in 6,000 square feet of living space. And you think, what is all this about? And you've got a row of cars and you've got this and that. Yes, we're allowed to prosper, but in reality, if we really examine our hearts, what do we need all that for? What are we doing with all this stuff while we're watching all these other things suffer? And I'm not saying don't protect yourselves and don't have a savings or whatever, or, you know, like we would say, our old folks would say, rainy day account stuff or a stash of this or that, or, you know, you take care of your own house first because that's biblical. But sometimes enough's got to be enough. Amen. Amen. He said, my house shall be called of all nations. I guess we need to clarify even this because now they're saying it's a house of prayer for all nations and everything you want to bring in. You want to bring Islam. You want to bring, you know, the Baha'i. You want to bring the Hare Krishna. You want to bring Mormons and everybody else. Bring them all in because my house is a prayer for all, a house of prayer for all nations. And I don't believe that's what he intends here whatsoever. Because all through the scriptures, he told them to come out from among those things. Separate yourself from those things. Don't marry into those families because they'll have you doing those things. He wouldn't in these late hours of the, of the day say, oh, now it's all okay. Amen? Amen. My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer. And you know what? Everybody out there listening, and maybe if it's you in here too, isn't it sad how hard it is to get you in church to pray? We're having a prayer meeting. Will you come? Oh, I can't do that. We know about churches, there's five, six, seven hundred people. They have prayer meetings with eight, nine people in them because nobody will come to pray. You know what? Somebody prayed. That's why you came to Saving Grace. Amen. If you're out there in a church somewhere today, the reason you're there is because somebody prayed. Yes, the Lord called you and chose you, but somebody had you on their heart to pray for you. I know that's why I'm here. Amen. I know family members that prayed, but we've also looked at each other and said, who in the world else would have prayed before that? We don't know, but somebody did. House of prayer for all nations. You say your nation's fallen apart, but you won't go to a church and pray. And the church won't establish prayer. Something we've done ever since the beginning. I've shared with lots of you, you know, I know we spend an hour and a half here on Saturday mornings and come back, some of us on Saturday nights. But when I came to the Lord, we spent four to five hours in the evening in prayer meetings and still did a men's meeting or a Wednesday night meeting and a Sunday meeting and various things. And we still did our business and had our jobs and raised families and everything else and built a building or whatever else you want to talk about. Yet people don't want to pray. It's like saying I want to have a retirement fund when I 
get older, but you don't want to work, you don't want to save, you don't want to invest, you don't want to touch any money, you're not going to have an investment account at the end, a retirement account. Think about it. And asking people to pray. I've said this so many times, some of you have talked about it when you shared. We used to not let certain people come to the prayer meeting because we didn't think they were spiritual enough. And they would get mad. And now if we knock on the door, send a limo to pick them up, we can't get them to come. My, have things changed. Amen. What did Jesus do? He went away and prayed. What was he doing up there in the Mount of Transfiguration? He was praying. What did he do in Gethsemane? He went away. He chastised them. You couldn't pray for me, with me for one hour. And he went away and prayed some more. Prayer is our link to all the blessings and the things in the future we have in Christ. Prayer is what's going to sustain us through all these things because if we don't pray, we're not in before the Father being recharged. The Bible says uh, times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. Amen. You're getting stressed out. You feel weary and wiped out. Get in the presence of the Lord. That's prayer. That's worship. That's praise. How many of you had kids that never stopped asking you for something? <laughs> you got tired of that, didn't you? Why can't you just sit down and say, Mom, I love you, without having your hand out on the other side waiting for me to give you something? Or, Dad, I really appreciate you. You ever want to hear those words? Some of you are still waiting. <laughs> I know. I, I'm very thankful my kids, most of them, have said something to us over the years that sometimes it shocks me. But anyway, so my house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. Amen. Amen. So Jesus rode down the Mount of Olives. The people cheered. I know next week we'll talk about it's Passover. It's the time we celebrate the resurrection. That other thing is old ancient mysticism that goes way back before the time of Christ. And we're not celebrating an Easter bunny and rolling eggs and new life. We're celebrating the resurrection of the Lord and Savior, the Christ, the Messiah, the one who's coming again. The one who redeemed Israel, according to what he said. The one who made a way for us into the kingdom. That's what we celebrate. So as you hear all these people, and I was going to bring a tape of it, but all these people cheering and, yay, Lord, and go, Jesus, and we're going to be freed, and Rome's going to fall, and they're going to be driven out, and we're going to take back the city and the nation and the temple and everything else, and they're going to be gone from here and we're going to be self-ruled even though we remember when Jesus talked about uh, being in bondage we said why we've never been in bondage to any man while well, you're in bondage to the Romans we're going to be free from all of that and all the world is going to bow down to us and within a week you're going to hear Crucify him! Crucify him! As the hearts of people are revealed. Remember what Simeon said to Mary? He's for the fall and the rise of many in Israel. And that the intents of the heart will be made known. Hey, what happens when... All you're doing is preaching and teaching the word and loving people and sharing and so on. And people get ugly and nasty with you. Their hearts are being revealed. They're not of that mindset. And so they're going to put people up there. They're going to pay them because the Pharisees were all upset. Other places it says they told them, hey, tell those people to start sh stop shouting like that. 
and so on. And what did Jesus say? Hey, if they stop, the rocks are going to cry out. I ain't going to let no rock out shout me. <laughs> Amen? Amen? The rocks will cry out. Somebody is going to praise God. Somebody is going to acknowledge the truth and know the truth. Yet, they'll put people up there and they're going to have them say, testify, you know, get your story together. But they couldn't. They weren't smart enough to talk to each other and line their stories up. They didn't even match. It's like when you go to court sometimes and it's all staged and not that the judge or the lawyer's involved, but the people are going to lie about somebody. And they can't even get their own story straight. Yeah, it still goes on today. Yep. Yeah. And they're going to... The religious. That's why in a lot of the churches, you know what? We need a real cleansing. Because there's religious people that will stone you in a minute. Amen. Sitting in the church saying, I love Jesus, but don't you dare cross me. Ain't no snake that's got venom as dangerous as mine. Amen? Amen. And he'll be crucified. Remember, nobody took his life. Amen. He laid it down. Nobody's to blame. He laid it down. Amen. The Jews didn't kill him. Amen. He laid it down. Amen. 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 Well, Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for this word. And Lord, I just thank you that this word is life and power, you said. It is spirit. And so, Father, as that spirit is nurturing in every one of our spirit man, uh, mingling with us in our spirit man to feed us and to build us up, we thank you that it's creating life in us. And Lord God, thank you that a prayer is a vital part of us. We need more prayer. We need more fellowship in the saints. We need communal prayer where we come together as the saints and we worship. We lift up the name of the Lord. We praise your holy name. I just pray this morning, everybody listening in this morning, Listen, if you've never met Jesus, it's not about going to church, just church. It's not about, you know, getting out your Bible and knowing some passages or quoting things you see on the Internet where somebody said some religious thing. It's not about that. It's about you having a personal relationship, what the Bible calls being born again in John 3, 3, because Jesus said, except a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. You can't make it there. You can't see it. You can't experience it. And we're living it and walking in it because we've been born again. He said that we all must become as children and be converted and receive the kingdom as children. In other words, it's like saying to your mom or dad when you were little, Mom, how does the car start? And they say, you have to put the key in it and turn. And you say, oh, okay. And that's how we're to receive the teaching on the kingdom. Jesus said, I'm the way into the kingdom. You can't go in by any other way. We say, oh, okay, then that's what we'll do. And that's all we have to do. And begin to follow him. The Bible says that if we will give up our life, we'll find our life. If you've been experiencing a horrific life, all you got to do is let it go and take on the life that Christ will give you. If you've been living what you think is a decent life, but you know you're not fulfilled, it's still the same process. Tell him, Lord, I give you my life. He hears you. He's there where you are. I give you my life, and I want the life you'll give me. He'll meet you there. And from this day forward, it can be a new day in your life. The Bible says we must repent of our sins to be forgiven. And again, that's why Jesus laid down his life, took on himself the punishment for all of our sins at the cross so that we could enter the kingdom of heaven. God bless and have a good day.